Today's topic is public goods. By the end of this lesson, you should be able to set up and solve models of decision making in the presence of public goods and explain how the presence of public goods will affect market outcomes. You should also be able to provide examples of real-world public goods and analyze the effects of government policies on markets for public goods. A public good is a good from which everyone benefits. Another way to think about what a public good is is that it is a good that is available in a single quantity to all consumers. A third way to think about what a public good is is to think about its characteristics. Public goods have two characteristics. The first characteristic of a public good is that it is non-rival. If a good is non-rival, one person's enjoyment of the good does not diminish the amount available to someone else. The second characteristic of a public good is that it is non-excludable. It is not possible to prevent people from enjoying the benefits of a non-excludable good. Let's consider potential examples of public goods to determine whether they satisfy the conditions of non-rivalness and non-excludability. Most private goods are rival and excludable. If a good is rival, if I consume some of it, there is less available for you. In addition, it is possible for me to prevent you from enjoying the good, for example, by making you pay for it. Examples of goods that are rival and excludable include a house, a cupcake, a cell phone, a cup of coffee, or just about any other consumer product that you can think of. If you think that some of these goods are not rival, in the sense that if you consume them, someone else could consume them as well, you are right, but then ask yourself, why used versions of these products cost less than new ones. The reason why is that you have used up some of the product, which is what makes it rival. An example of a good that is rival but non-excludable is a public road. It is not possible to prevent people from using it, but if enough people try to use it at the same time, its rival nature becomes obvious. There are some goods that are non-rival, but excludable. One example is cable and satellite television broadcasts. They are non-rival because it is possible for many people to view the same broadcast at the same time. They are excludable because if I do not own the equipment provided by the cable or satellite company, I cannot view the broadcast. The last category of goods are goods which are non-rival and non-excludable. These goods are pure public goods. The classic example of a pure public good is national defense. National defense is non-rival because everyone in a country enjoys the same level of protection from its defense. It is non-excludable because it is not possible to prevent people from enjoying this protection, regardless of whether they pay taxes or not. In general, the market will provide suboptimal levels of public goods. The reason why is that it is possible for people to enjoy the benefits of public goods without paying for them. Given this, Private producers have little incentive to provide public goods, as there is no way for them to recoup their costs of production by charging for the good. The problem of public goods provision is characterized by a condition known as the free rider problem. To see how the free rider problem works, consider this hypothetical example. Suppose that you are in an economy with four other people. You must decide how much of a public good to provide. Each of you has a budget of $10, and each of you has the same utility function. Your utility from each dollar that you spend on private consumption is four. Your utility from each dollar that you spend on the public good is two. Note that this utility comes not just from the dollars that you spend on the public good, but the dollars that the other four members of the economy spend as well. Your decision is how to divide the $10 between your own private consumption and the public good. 
You can spend as much or as little on the public good as you like. What do you do? This table examines the decision that you and the other four members of the economy face. Note that we can illustrate the problem by focusing on the extreme cases of spending all of your income on the public good or spending none of it on the public good. The intermediate cases where you spend some of your income on each good do not change what your optimal choice is. If you and the other four members of the group decide to spend all of your income on the public good, then your utility, as well as the utility of the other four people, will be 100. If you decide to spend all of your money on the public good, but no one else does, then your utility will be 20. If you keep all of your money for private consumption, and everyone else does as well, then your utility will be 40. Finally, if you keep all of your money for private consumption, but everyone else in the economy spends their money on the public good, then your utility is 120. Note that regardless of what the other four people in the economy do, your utility is higher if you spend your money on private consumption than if you spend it on the public good. Since everyone else faces the same incentives that you do, the outcome is likely to be that no one spends their money on the public good. Note that this outcome is not Pareto efficient. The reason why it is Pareto inefficient is that it is possible to make everyone better off by having them spend their money on the public good instead. Despite this, no one has an incentive individually to make the choice that would result in the Pareto efficient outcome. This is the essence of the free rider problem, and it is why public goods tend to be provided at suboptimal levels when the choice of how much to provide is left to the private market. So, what is the efficient level of a public good to provide? For public goods that are provided in all or nothing amounts, it is efficient to provide the good as long as the sum of consumers' reservation prices for the good is greater than the cost of providing the good. Remember that a consumer's reservation price is the price that makes the consumer indifferent between having all of her income and not having the public good, and having her income reduced by the amount of the reservation price and having the public good. For a public good that is available in different quantities, the optimal quantity will be the quantity at which the sum of all consumers' marginal rate of substitution between money and the public good equals the marginal cost of providing the good. These efficiency conditions illustrate the fundamental difference between public goods and private goods. With a private good, everyone consumes a different quantity but pays the same price. Since each consumer is consuming up to the point where his or her marginal rate of substitution equals the market price, everyone has the same marginal rate of substitution for a private good. For a public good, the situation is reversed. Because everyone consumes the same quantity, each person has a different marginal rate of substitution for the good and would be willing to pay a different price. This concludes this lesson on public goods.